For me, astrology is recognizing that we are cosmic. I love to think of astrology as a language. Even the things we fear is an indication of our purpose. When I see Pisces, I always think art. The second house, it gives us a clue to our talents. Virgo, Gemini, that instantly says like writer. Aquarius is the way show of Using our labor for more than wages, our bliss, our rage, they're both contagious. They are on the crime, we move through time. Joy is the compass, we live in our are listening to the Black Women's Department of Labor, a podcast and project by yours truly, Taja Lindley, where we examine the intersections of race, gender, and the double entendre of labor to work and to give birth. At the end of the last episode, we started getting into existential questions about how our work in the economy may or may not align with our purpose. And in today's episode, we're going to talk about discovering your purpose with the support of astrology because existential questions are great for astrology, okay? (laughs) About a decade ago, I wrote an article entitled Pleasure Politics, Employment, Economic Justice, and the Erotic. And in it, I shared my personal vision for economic justice. Inspired by Audre Lorde's essay, Uses of the Erotic, I was curious about what an economy based on our passions and our purpose would look like and feel like. To move beyond living to work and working to live. To move beyond working 9 to 5 until we're 65 or die. It never sat well with me that we're expected to work most of our lives at a job we kind of like or kind of hate and have to reserve our sense of satisfaction and fulfillment for evenings, weekends, and employer-approved time off. I've organized my life and my labor around how to fulfill my purpose and my calling. I mean, I founded a business called Color Girls Hustle for crying out loud. (laughs) I'm deeply concerned and curious about how we align our hustle with our values and with our purpose for being alive. And to be honest, I don't think anyone is here to work. I don't think that is why we're alive, but certainly our paid labor can be a way to express what we're here to do and who we have the potential to become. We can also discover that our purpose is in our relationships or in our unpaid volunteer work or in our hobbies or in our interests or even even in our rest. There are many ways to discover or create your purpose, and astrology is among one of my favorite tools. I've been studying and following lunar cycles for a decade, and during the last few years, I've been doing a deep dive in studying my natal chart and my personal astrology. I've been so deeply moved by what astrology has to offer us that it felt important to make sure that I share it with all of you. Think of this podcast episode like a workshop. While you're listening, I suggest that you grab some paper, a pen, and your natal chart to take notes and follow along because we're going deeper than your sun sign and way further than your big three. I also created a digital workbook available on my Patreon that you can download and print to support you with making sense of what is shared in this episode. If you do not have your birth chart, go to astro.com and put in your birth day, month, year, time, and location to pull it up. If you do not know your birth time or location, but you know the day, month, and year you were born, you'll still get value out of this episode. So stay tuned. Today's episode features an intergenerational lineup of two Black astrologers who I know and respect. But before I introduce them to you, I've got a few announcements to make. First, a big, big thank you to the Economic Hardship Reporting Project for supporting this podcast. We recently received a small grant to help us with the second half of the season. This is such a beautiful way to celebrate the upcoming two-year anniversary of the podcast. That's right. If you've been tuning in since this was called Birth Justice Podcast NYC, then you already know. The podcast and I share a birthday, but of course, (laughs) I'm older. (laughs) 
I'll be sharing more about the birthday shenanigans in our next episode. But this is a friendly reminder. If you're enjoying your listening experience, please consider supporting this podcast in monetary and non-monetary ways. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, leave a review, sign up for our newsletter, follow us on the gram, share your fave episode with a friend, purchase the podcast music, become a patron, or make a donation via PayPal because while the grant we receive is great, and I hope more organizations choose to do the same, this podcast continues to be made possible by listeners like you. Patrons receive exclusive content, including full-length interviews with each of our guests and other goodies like the workbook I created to accompany this episode. Now, let me introduce you to our guests. Meet Daria, a revolutionary lover looking to the stars and the soil for guidance in this lifetime. She's an astrologer with a Taurus stellium, which means she's got at least three planets in that sign, which emphasizes Taurus energy and the Venusian vibes in her life and in her work. I am a very personal um, astrologer. Like I love relationships and like looking at people's charts on an individual level. I'm a Scorpio moon. So really interested in like the psychology of why people do things. My Scorpio is in my 12th house. It's super intense. I think one of the big values that I bring is like, but things do need to die. A death process is very important to transformation. And one of the symbols of the Scorpio is the Phoenix and like this rebirth process. And so I'm I'm really interested in what must die, right? And like what we have to release and let go of to be new and to be in this world that we're imagining, this world that so many of like our movement workers are interested in building that is outside of the state, outside of a capitalist structure. And right now, like as I'm studying astrology, I'm also studying like anarchy and abolition and anti-capitalist theories. So I'm drawn to, you know, the overlaps in what I'm studying in astrology and abolition work. The birth chart is a circle, right? And like thinking about how all of these planets are in relationship to one another. Also thinking about like the community principles of astrology just like leaning into practicing astrology is a way of like rejecting colonial systems and colonial ideologies and Daria's approach to astrology also includes recognizing the ways we are all interconnected I I love to think of astrology as a language, and it's a language that spans many different spaces in time. I really love astrology because it says that we as human beings, as, as life forms, have a relationship to the planets. I think a lot of people accept that like, yes, the sun can impact your mood. And so astrology says, so does the moon, so does Venus, um, so does Mars, so do all of these other constellations and celestial bodies. Like they are living beings, living bodies who have been around for a lot longer than we have, who have witnessed a lot, a lot more than we have, um, and so have some wisdom for us. Now meet Deborah Singletary, an artist and an astrological consultant who's been practicing astrology for over 40 years. I see astrology as the study and practice of understanding our connection with the cosmos. And so essentially, for me, astrology is recognizing that we are cosmic. But tell that to my landlord, should I not have money to pay her? And so sometimes our lives are abstracted in such a way that we don't feel that divine connection of our inheritance. And so astrology helps people to tune into what might be obstructing and what in their nature might be obstructing their relationship with the divine. But it can also confirm our sense that we have of knowing something. It's an invitation to trust the cosmos and therefore to trust ourselves. 
Her work with the National Black Feminist Organization in her 20s is what introduced her to astrology several decades ago. Now, as an artist and an interfaith minister, she brings a creative and spiritual approach to her astrology classes, workshops, and one-on-ones. My astrology tends to be a little more psychologically oriented and spiritually oriented. And what really interests me about astrology is that it shows us survival strategies that we hooked onto, usually in our earliest youth, as a form of protection. And astrology can show us those places where we're hanging on to emotions and attitudes that we cultivated in our youth for our survival, but which might be stifling our joy in the present. I'm interested in our ability to access those parts of ourselves which are not necessarily public, but which betray and portray our sense of entitlement and well-being and our own power. I consider myself spiritually centered. I'm an interfaith minister, but I don't need the other person to be spiritual to have a dialogue with them. I just funnel everything through my own spiritual center. And my number one belief is that we can live through, overcome, survive, and thrive even in regard to situations that might seem very limiting. Before we get to finding purpose with astrology, let's talk about how you can discover your purpose without it. When I asked Deborah how people can find their purpose, here's what she offered. By what they want, their desire, the things that they hate are a clue to vocation. So if it turns you on If it makes you feel juicy, if it excites you, if you find yourself musing about it and thinking about it, then that is a way to know the direction to go. And sometimes even the things we fear is an indication of our purpose. I don't fear bungee jumping. You know why I don't have any interest in it? I don't want to bungee jump. So I'm I'm not afraid. That's not what I want to do. But I'm afraid of doing a mural. You know, I might be fearful of something artistically. I am only going to be afraid of that with which I have some unrecognized, unreconciled relationship with. So if I ask somebody, well, you know, well, what do you want to do? And they say, well, you know, I, I've always wanted to be an artist, but I can't paint. Oh, I once had a, a client who um, was getting ready to retire. And I asked her, well, you know, what do you want to do? And she says, well, you know, I've always wanted to be an actor, but I'm getting ready to be 65. I have no acting skills. And so my counsel with her was that that was saying something to her and didn't necessarily mean that she should start auditioning for a broad way, but it did mean that that was something soulful that she needed to look in the direction of. And I always suggest to people, do it a little bit. At a family gathering, read a monologue. Like it doesn't have to be Everything doesn't have to be on stage before applauding audiences. And about a year later, I got an invitation from her to watch her dance on stage. Oh. And when we look to astrology to support us in our purposeful paths, we got to know the basics. So here's a little Astro 101 for cosmic newbies and a refresher for our seasoned listeners. I'm sure you've heard of zodiac signs. Each of the 12 signs are described by their element and their modality. Knowing this is foundational for everything else we will discuss here and for your astrological journey. Let us begin with the elements. 
So yeah, elements are the four elements, water, fire, air, earth, and each sign has an element. So the big water signs, you know them? Yes, because I'm one of them. I'm a cancer over here. Yes. <laughs> Scorpio is very watery yeah. and Pisces is also very mm-hmm. watery too. When you think of water, what comes to mind typically? I think about shape shifting. When I witness the ocean, it's constantly moving. And even though it's mm-hmm, steady mm-hmm. in its form, it's also steady in its change. And also mm-hmm. the power of water needs to be respected. Like it is a calming, soothing place mm-hmm. to go to, but don't sleep on Ooh, the power yeah. of the ocean. Like the ocean can, water can do something. <laughs> things. Yes, it could be pleasant, but it can also be so very fierce yeah. in its power. Fierce is a great word. I mean, like water can also be very devastating. So water signs are very powerful. When I think of water, I think of feelings, emotions, fluid. If you think about like crying, release, cleansing. If you think about the water signs in your life, I'm sure emotions comes to surface. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and I also wanna um, I wanna put a stop to the cancer slander where everyone's always like <laughs> all the memes about cancer, cancer is crying, and I'm like, I do more than cry. Okay, y'all better understand the element of water besides the emotions. But yes, the emotions are a big part. I'm a very, you know, I'm a very watery person. I have a lot of water in my chart. So I resonate deeply with the water element, and I also understand it in a more nuanced way than these meme makers who just mm-hmm. be out here talking about how we be crying all the time. We love the cancers. <laughs> we love how nurturing cancers are. So that's another thing about water. You can't grow anything without water. And then fire. There are big three fire signs. Sagittarius, Aries, Leo. Mm-hmm. And what comes to mind when you think of <laughs> fire? <laughs> Popping ah! off. Okay. <laughs> Lots of heat. Like you can feel the heat, whether that's in some like fun debate, (laughs) you know, doing a little roasting or some joking, or if it's the ways in which people get fired up about things that they believe in or the people that they love and care about. And also, you know, I want to get to this flammable piece because I feel like fiery energy, especially for the Leos in my life, it's like a standoff. Who going to apologize? It could just really spiral into something. I'm not... I'm not putting no sort of... Is this Leo slander? Yeah, no, this ain't Leo slander, and I'm not stereotyping (laughs) fire. But like all elements, Uh there's all these different sides to the expression. The fire is very dynamic. Like, you can really see it. Fire dances, it moves. Think of fire the sun. Leos are ruled by the sun. Fire tends to be very inspiring. Mm. Um, And again, because you can see it, you just feel moved to be like... You know, when you see somebody else shine, you want to shine. Also, you mentioned apologizing. We'll get into that when we talk about (laughs) modalities with with Leos. Yeah, they have big boss energy. Okay, so air. What are the three air signs? So we got Libra, we got Aquarius, Mm -hmm. and we got Gemini. And yes, when I think of air, I think of movement, the wind, boom, boom, going this direction, that direction. When I think about air signs, I think about communication. Mm-hmm. I think about conversations, you know, yes. a lot of thinking. I'm a Gemini yes. rising. So, you know, I had to stop my Gemini slander when I realized <laughs> <laughs> how much Gemini, Gemini was in my chart. slander, Leo slander. Okay. <laughs> but I just think, yeah, movement. Moving, talking, thinking, sharing ideas, like sharing information, like moving like the wind. Yeah, all of that. You know, the wind carries seed. When I think of air or or wind or even like flying, that's high. Like you look upward. So like a lot of like intellectual thinking, you know, higher thinking is what I think of when I think of air signs as well. They love a conversation. Geminis are so knowledgeable about lots of different things. That's because they, they are really talking and are curious and research everything and like they'll be really random like they might know how to drive a motorcycle and you just like had no idea (laughs) so you're like on a trip with them and like we need a motorcycle and it's like oh (laughs) you had this skill in the back of your pocket we love Mm -hmm. gemini (laughs) for that reason okay earth signs the best of them all i know i was like is this a save the best for last uh the tori <laughs> yes. the tori stellium over here okay yes 
<laughs> okay, so yes, Taurus, Capricorn, Virgo. What comes to your mind when you think of earth signs? Foundational, something I can lean on and depend on, but that can also mean stubborn, sometimes immovable. Like when I think about the earth, yeah. it's like you can't just go and just move a mountain. I think a little bit about stubbornness on that front, but definitely very reliable, consistent. When I think about the ground outside my home or going on a hike, there's just a way that I feel held inside of this structure of how earth is set yeah. up. Like I, I do feel held. Earth signs are slow processors. They need time to go through things. Like for me as a Taurus, it's like, I need to feel it all out. I need to hear it. I need to taste it. I need to <laughs> sit with it, you know, like, so it takes time to do that. And also when you think of earth, it's, it's something like you can actually physically, like you said, held. So like very material. Earth signs are really good with money. They, they know how to like materially manifest. And like you said, like build. Whereas like air and water, it's a little harder to capture. Even fire, it's a little harder to yeah capture or hold in one's hand. Whereas earth, you can really dig in and hold it, feel it, and make something with it. Now that we've covered elements, let's get into modalities. And we're talking from a Northern Hemispheric lens. What we talk about here will be slightly different for listeners in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, so the modalities I think of in relationship to seasons. So cardinal is, you know, the start of the season. So cardinal fire is Aries. Um, so it's the beginning of spring. And then cardinal air is... Libra, and it starts the beginning of fall. Now, I'm going to take up the cardinal okay, water because so your girl's a cancer over here. And that <laughs> we start yes. the summertime. That's also why I'm not going to stand for the slander because people in the West love to talk about summertime, grind all winter, shine all summer. Like, summer starts with cancer season. I just want us all to be to be clear. And it's so confusing for all of us because it's like <laughs> we forget. <laughs> I I always forget like oh shit like we go from Gemini partying it up to fucking deep in our emotions stuff. <laughs> like what is feelings in I tell people listen summer, we're like wait Wait. Listen, welcome to cancer season where y'all are doing <laughs> what I'm doing all year round, <laughs> just feeling my feelings. It's intense. And then the last is the cardinal earth, yes. Capricorn. Yeah. So the beginning of winter, frigid. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I met uh, some really stiff Capricorns. I was like, man, your humor is so dry. You're just so dry. Yeah. But I was like, oh. They have the, yeah. That's their yeah, thing. You know a Capricorn thing. from their dry ass humor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So those are the, the cardinal. And cardinal essentially just means that like they take initiation. They start the thing. And then with fixed, this is the middle of the season. Mm -hmm. So it sees it through. It's a stabilizing force. So when you were talking about Leo's not really apologizing, this is where that fixed energy comes in. They're very stubborn. It's their way or no way. And Taurus, that's a fixed earth sign. So we have Leo as the fixed fire. We have Taurus as the fixed earth. And then we have for fixed air, Aquarius. So Aquarius, it's like, you know, like they're stubborn to their beliefs, stubborn to their like their ideals. They're their like social justice oriented folks who are just like super radical you can't tell them nothing to fix waters scorpio again very like set in their ways powerhouses like when they have a goal kind of similar to that capricorn energy this is why capricorn and scorpios tend to like link up um, have an affinity yeah just like gives it their all once they have something they're focused in on so yeah then the last one is mutable um and mutable is the change agent it's the end of the season so it trans transforms energy to make it new and so what comes to mind immediately is gemini so that is a mutable air sign and that it came to me immediately of, too yeah I'll tell you why the end of done. spring <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell us now why did, it come, why did it come to mind 
I could just be so set in my beliefs. So if we're at work and we all hating on the boss Mm -hmm. and we talking shit about the boss, Mm -hmm. but then the Gemini be going out to dinner with the boss. I'm like, (laughs) I thought we was just keeping in the corner saying we wasn't with this, but you over here going out to dinner with the boss. So I thought it was just because it was Gemini. But then when I learned about modalities, it's like, oh, it's like Mm -hmm. sort of a double, a doubling of it. You know, it's just like, you're airy because yes, you move yes. you talk, like air can switch it up and then mutables can also yeah. switch it up so it's like they are the ones that they can switch it up and i was like dang i thought we was all on switch this page but up. you switched it up yeah so mutables switch it up and gemini mutable <laughs> gemini and I say that with all love. I'm not yeah. slandering nobody. I just I say it no with slander. all love. No slander. Just an observation. The Gemini energy is really like so. Like when I think of mutable, I think of like flexible or adaptable. And a Gemini can take any side at any moment. Okay. And this is my my fixed ass. It's like get away from me. Because <laughs> yesterday you were here and we were good because you were here. Now mm-hmm. today you over there. <laughs> now you gotta stay over there. There's no <laughs> hopping back over here for me. <laughs> okay. okay. I feel you that. gotta find somebody that will go with it. I'm not. So yeah, but I'm also a Sagittarius rising, so I confuse myself. <laughs> um. <laughs> So Sag is, you know, the opposite of Gemini. Both of these signs travel a lot, but Sagittarius is like far. Gemini might get around in the neighborhood. Sagittarius is like, okay, leaving the country and can really like be good in a whole a whole different climate and a whole different world. Like they're adaptable in that way. The other mutable sign is Virgo. So that's the earth. And Virgos are change agents in themselves. I feel like they are the ones who purify energy and get it down to its most simplest form. Like they're, they tend to be like minimalists. And then the last one is Pisces. It's just fluid water. Pisces is the most empathetic sign in the zodiac because it is just feeling what everyone is feeling and can like really identify with people of all different experiences and not just people, life forms, animals, trees. The Pisces is identifying (laughs) with every life form around, around them. Now I know, we talked about each sign as if they're a person. But when you get into your personal astrology, you realize that all of these energies are within each of us. Not in equal measure, of course, but there are specific ways that we embody these energetics. And your natal chart tells you how. So once you learn about each sign, their element, and their modality, this will support you in making sense and meaning of planets and houses in those signs. Knowing your houses requires knowing your birth time time and your birth location. But if you do not know your birth time or where you were born, but you know your birth date, you can still see what kind of energies you're working with, just with the elements and the modalities that Daria and I discussed. Our birth charts are essentially a snapshot of the cosmos when we're born. You too can see this snapshot without knowing your birth time, though if a planet changed signs that day, it can get a little tricky. But for many folks, you can see where the moon, the sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto were located when you were born. Take a look at where the planets are in your chart. What sign were they in when you were born? And notice any themes. Do you have a lot of planets in any of the elements of earth, air, fire, or water? Do you have a lot of planets in a particular modality like cardinal, fixed, or mutable? Understanding your energetics is a great way to think about vocation, purpose, and what gifts and talents you have to share and offer. So like if you have a concentration of elements, that can be really helpful. Um, So for instance, someone who is water heavy, I would definitely say like healing energy. Definitely consider some kind of like emotional support offering or like role and that could be through a myriad of ways. Healers work in many different modalities. If someone had a lot of air, 
right? Then I might say, okay, you're an influencer. <laughs> like you have, not even an influencer. I might say a fire sign is more of an influencer, but like an air sign is like an educator, kind of like mediator. So um, look at what you have a lot of emphasis in. So if you have a lot of Virgo, Gemini, that instantly says like writer, somebody that can like express their thoughts. And earth heavy, you're a builder, definitely have the power to like manifest material resources. If you know the time you were born and where you were born, you can get a more precise understanding of your personal astrology. Your birth time is used to calculate what was on the horizon when you were born, what we commonly refer to as the rising sign. And from there, the sky is divided into houses, with your rising sign being the first house. There are 12 houses total, and each house speaks to an area of life. As we go from each house to the next in our chart, it's a progression of energy, each house building on the last. For example, the seventh house is your house of partnerships and relating to people one-on-one. And your eighth house is your house of deepened and contractual relationships, like marriages to other people and mortgages with the bank. For the purposes of time, we're not going to get into what each house means, but rather focus on four houses that you can look to in your birth chart for some insight and direction when it comes to your purpose in this lifetime. When I asked Deborah where we should look to find a sense of purpose in our birth charts, she began with this. I would um, send them to their midheaven, which is the highest point of their chart. And it is that to which the developing soul aspires to and is ascending to. The midheaven is also called the 10th house. So you would look at the sign on the cusp of the 10th house. Whenever people have planets in the 10th, uh, my sense is that they are going to do something in the public. But for somebody like me who doesn't have anything in the 10th house, but has something like everybody on the cusp, we want to think of that as the profession, as in terms of that which we profess. Yes. And that's where the public comes in, but it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be in a public. This is what we profess. This is what's true for us. So in my chart, for example, Pisces is on the cusp of the 10th house, but I don't have anything else in the 10th house. But that doesn't mean that I don't have a career. It doesn't mean I don't have a calling, but it does mean that my approach to careers might always be nebulous and instinctive and emotional and intuitive, all of which are Pisces words. I worked for a long time as a secretary and in and, and corporate America. But I wasn't professing that, you know, I was, I, you know, my, I was professing, you know, social activism via my feminist work, which then led me to my the spiritual, the spiritual path. But I'll tell you, those people, my bosses would call me in their office and start telling me their troubles and they, and they'd be crying. Sometimes they would cry. I was like, who color child are you talking to? Like what? You know, you got you got a big job. I'm working for you. You you making mm. sixty thousand. I'm making twelve dollars an hour. Like what? But I understood that I was always incognito in my job. I was hired to be a secretary, but I was in sense a counselor. So that would give that's very ten thousand. So if Pisces uh-huh. is your midheaven and the ruler of Pisces is Neptune, where is Neptune in your chart? Now you're getting personal. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Um, ne- my Neptune is in the fifth house of creative expression. And Pisces has a very yearning kind of quality to it. So there's just no doubt that my calling is to be an artist. And there are other indications of this. Also, I have a couple of planets in the fifth house. So it's real clear that I'm called to be an artist and to address issues of soul through artistic means. What I had to learn to get out of my head was great artist. So the great was such a black for me. You know, it's like, I want to be a great artist. And then I, I realized, honey, baby, sweetie, not about 
being great, take that off. I had to just follow the calling to be an artist. And what I did was to begin making art the way I did when I was a child. And the fifth house is also the house of children. So I remembered I I did painting. I painted when I was in the third grade. That's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to paint like a child. And that was actually how I started my um, journey as a painter, not really expecting to be an exhibiting artist. I didn't think that was possible. But of course, that I have Neptune on the public house, the, the 10th house is a public house that does suggest that there is a public affiliation to my art. Have y'all heard of me? I'm teasing. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't mean that I'm a household word, nor do I expect to be, but um, I'm open to it. But there is something public about the way I deal with art, including teaching the public to be artists. Many of Deborah's clients are artists and creatives. So not only does she make art, she also supports artists through her work. And I want to recap really quickly because Deborah just layered several things here. She located her midheaven at the cusp of her 10th house. She identified the sign of her midheaven, which is Pisces, and made meaning about what might a Piscean public life look like. She looked back to her work experience to see how Pisces energetically showed up when she was in the workforce. Then we identified the ruler of Pisces, which is Neptune in modern astrology. She then looked for where Neptune was in her chart, the fifth house and layered the meaning of the fifth house of children, art, and play to further describe her work. You can do this too. Look for your midheaven. Identify the sign. Look at how that sign may describe your work to date, whether you were paid for that work or not. Then find the ruler of that sign in your chart. The house of the ruler will add more nuance and detail to your sense of work, purpose, and vocation. I've outlined all of this and more in a worksheet featured in the Patreon only digital workbook that I created specifically for this episode. Be sure to grab your copy at patreon.com slash Taja Lindley. Now, since Deborah mentioned the fifth house, let's hear what else she has to say about this house and how it supports us in discovering our purpose. The fifth house has multiple meanings. Among them are self-expression. It also rules children and the eternal youth in all of us. It speaks to self-expression, creativity, and having children, birthing children, both from the body and from the spirit. In astrological talk, if one produces a book, it's every bit a child as one that comes directly out of the womb. Cultural conditioning says that when we grow up, we have to stop playing. That playing is the purview of children. Oh, yes, you can play on the weekends. You could take a two-week vacation every now and, you know, once a year, every other year, but that we are really living to work. And so adults ask children, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because they are misleading children to think that there's such a thing as growing up. I'm here to tell you there's not not really. You know, one doesn't ever grow up. Um, one grows into themselves. But, you know, you don't become something that you're not already when you're a child. And so everything, you know, you've got to pay the bills and you've got mortgage and and you have to clean the house and you have to work. Um, work becomes what we're living for. And when we can fit it in, a little fun. Our culture tells us that work is first and you try to fit in play if you can. But I believe in beauty before duty. The fun comes first. The purpose of work is to support our play. So play isn't something that we should fit in for two hours after we get home from work and then cook dinner and feed the kids. And then maybe there's an hour left for ourselves. Play is a primary essential expression of who we are. And people could resist this and say, but I got to pay the rent. You know, 
we don't have enough time to talk about the ways that conditioning has led us to believe that we have to work for our living and then describe work as denial of the self when the fifth house is for the growth of the self. So saying that we have to work before we play is putting the cart before the horse. Many people live dull, unhappy, dissatisfied lives because they feel they have to work. But as an artist, you ever hear people talk about your body of work? Yes. Or your body, you know, your the body. That's what gave me a clue mm. that work was to serve my art. And so if I am not arting, if I am not making art, if I'm not engaged in play and self-expression, then I'm going to be sick. I'm, wow. I'm going to have, if it's art, my body of work is going to be piddling. Mm. Because I haven't developed it, because I have made the work, usually meaning our job, more important. I also felt free to choose fun jobs. So I worked in publishing, I worked in the theater, I worked for arts institutions. You know, I always had fun jobs because I understood the importance of play. If I had truncated myself, in these jobs that did not feed my spirit or soul and did not enable me to really give freely of my gifts. So the idea is that it is through play that we know our identities. Play is sacred. I have even asked grown men, you know, what did they want to be when they were a child? And they would say, I wanted to, you know, play pro football. Now, I'm talking of, to a man of 45. The chances of him being a pro football player, I don't think so. But that he wanted to be a pro football player might suggest his need to be competitive, active, work with a team. And pro football isn't the only place you can do that. So the pro football could be symbolic of what they wanted to do. When I was a child, I loved dolls, loved them, loved them, play, could play with them for hours. Fortunately, nobody suggested that meant I was to have a lot of children because I haven't had none, at least not from my womb, though I've given birth to many projects. But I have come to be the spiritual mother of many. So my playing with dolls might have been an indication of my interest in people. So that I like to play that was a clue. I love that. Returning to our inner child, our younger selves are a compass for finding our purpose. Deborah talks about the cart before the horse, putting work before play. And it's not just a metaphor, y'all. I mentioned earlier that the houses represent a progression of energy, that when you go from one house to another, the energy builds. The house of play, the fifth house, comes before the sixth house, which governs daily habits, health, day-to-day -day work, and service. So that means play informs our work. Play informs our health and our well-being. Play informs our service. And the sixth house, the health of the sixth house has to do with those rituals that feed our souls. The health of the human being has to do with the sacred and allowing the sacred into our lives, creating the sacred and participating in the sacred with our own self-expression, which gets to be minimized as play. Not, but I say the real play is holy, but they say play, that's trivial. And when thinking about our purpose, there's one more house we should take a look at. The second house, it gives us a clue to our talent 
talents and talents are our divine gifts. It's our divine inheritance. Usually we enjoy doing what our talents are. And we can be talked out of our talents when people say, well, if you really want to make money, be a lawyer. But our talents are those things that turn us on. I think of the sensual and I think of what feels good, what tastes good. I think of loving um, the ways in which we love our lives and caress our lives. To recap, we're layering zodiac signs with houses in our chart, and we get more information about what these houses mean for us by the planets that are in the house, as well as the ruler of the sign of that house. If you'd like some additional support and guidance of understanding rulerships and applying it to your chart, I created a handy cheat sheet available for download exclusively at patreon.com slash Lee. If you join at the creative foundation level or above, you get a immediate access to the workbook. Now, Daria and I discussed Fannie Lou Hamer's chart, which will further illustrate how we layer this information. If you're not already aware, Fannie Lou Hamer was a Black woman activist, organizer, and leader in the civil rights movement. In 1961, a white doctor in Mississippi gave Fannie Lou Hamer a hysterectomy without her consent a.k.a. forced sterilization. And the doctor did this while she was undergoing surgery to remove a uterine tumor. Unfortunately, Fannie Lou Hamer's story was not uncommon, and it was violations like these that led Black women to create the framework of reproductive justice in the 90s. She has an incredible chart, and like when I looked at it, I was just like, of course, this is her chart. So if you had to guess, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer was an amazing organizer, revolutionary worker. If you had to guess her 10th house, what would you guess? Oh. Her 10th house. And like, I'm telling you, it's like, it's like on it. Organizer. Is it a... Mm, okay. And her six her sixth house and her 10th house are both like hidden. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Dang. I feel put on the spot. I feel like I don't even know because I kind of want to guess maybe a fire <laughs> sign, but I don't even, am I okay. in the right, am I in the right element? Is it fire? Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's air. It's air. It's okay. air. Okay. But think of like justice, you know, Libra. She was... Okay. The scales. Okay. That yes. makes sense. Yes. Um, so yeah, so her 10th house, and I mean, like you say fire and it's interesting because it's like her fire placement, her son is in her 10th house of Libra. And so like, when you think of their son's sign, it's like really like how you show up and like that motivating fire that's outward. And so her son is in her 10th house of Libra, which is all about fairness, what's right, doing what's right, justice truth that feels really spot on for her but then her also she has this sixth house um her house of work i don't know do you want to guess it yeah so it's a gemini yes 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 it's gemini she was really like on the ground and working with farmers and local folks like you know she wasn't a celebrity organizer she was really rooted in the community on the ground and that's another thing about gemini it's very local energy and really good at connecting the dots you were talking about air signs being that wind that carries information. She was really good at connecting, you know, the farmers and moving them to like support with like voting, right? And like organizing them in that way. So yeah, Fannie Lou Hamer, sixth house, tenth house, air sign, a lot of movement work, talking about, like you said, truth and being very like intellectually sharp in terms of calling out the systems. Yeah, I can see that that communication piece, that conversation piece. And we do rely a lot on conversation as our way to connect. So for someone to be an organizer Mm -hmm. and an activist who is using the power of their voice and the gift of their ability to connect people in the service of Mm -hmm. their 10th house, in the pursuit of justice and truth and yeah, balancing the scales, like seeing something that is unequal. Like I, I think about that too with Libra, like seeing 
something that is out of balance and a desire to correct it. Yeah, and they also, Fannie Lou Hamer also has her Jupiter in the sixth house. Um, And Jupiter is the planet of expansion and blessings and gifts that emphasizes for her that energy of like, when you are on the right side of things, (laughs) then things (laughs) will go, like will move smoothly for you, more smoothly for you. So it's like, you know, she was, Someone who was using that Gemini energy for good, right? Like, because Gemini, you know, you could be carrying information in a very it could be different gossip. way. Like, it could be gossip, exactly, right? But she was like, no, I need, like, my people need to know what's going on on the ground. And that work was really rewarded, right? Like, she had a lot of wins in her lifetime. Now I'm going to offer myself up as an example. (laughs) If you've been tuning into this podcast, you have a general sense of who I am, what I do, and what I care about. Deborah uses a Placidus house system. And within that house system, Aquarius is the cusp of my 10th house. My midheaven is in Aquarius. What I've come to understand, it's the humanitarian, someone who is concerned with the greater good of all, and also might be a little out of the box, unconventional, off the beaten path. And I find that in my work life to be true because I sometimes do things in ways people don't understand. And it really pains me sometimes when people don't get what I'm up to and I'll try to explain it in different kinds of ways. But in my mid-20s, what I decided instead was that I would be a living example of what it is I'm trying to explain. Perhaps someone's imagination cannot meet what it is that I'm explaining. And so I want to just sort of live out what it is I'm talking about and for it to make sense in the doing that people can look to my way showing to be like oh i understand what she's creating and some people sometimes people still don't get it when i look at charts that have aquarius on the midheaven i say well i hope you're not trying to get a job with the post office or get a civil servant job in in my time <laughs> that was you know our parents wanted us to get a job get a good job a good pay, get a civil servant, because you, if you get one of them, you get a pension. And, and I say to them, look, don't work for the post office because I will never get my mail. And and I say that that's not the, that's a not nine to five assignation. You know, I, I'm an auntie. So I want, I frankly, and maybe a hypocrite because I want all my children to have jobs, right? All my 21 nieces and nephews because I want them to be secure. I don't want them to have to struggle. But if one of them has Uranus on the 10th house, I know I can give up that for them, that they would not be happy in one job for the rest of their lives. And the thing about Aquarius is Aquarius is the avant-garde. So get over having people understand you. It is through people's reaching that they come to be strengthened. When we understand, we're often not growing. So like you and I, we can have lovely conversations where we agree with each other. And frankly, I do love those conversations. However, it's also that conversation where I go, Taja, you say, what? Girl, is you crazy? And, and and then that's how I'm going to grow. So that Aquarius is the way shower. But where is the ruler of Aquarius? Where is Uranus in your chart? It is in my seventh house. Um, Uranus in the seventh house suggests to me that your calling does have to do with other people. And in a way that could sometimes be upsetting to people and in a way that challenges <laughs> their preconceived notions about right and wrong. And, and it also says that in some way you have a bond with the public to serve the public despite the ways that it makes them or even you uncomfortable. You know what? What else do, do you have? Anything in your tent at all? Any planets? Jupiter. Uh, <laughs> okay, let me just say this. Could you write me your autograph and mail it to me so I can say I know her? Uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> or I knew her. 
Um, because that does suggest to me that you're going to know a lot of people. But let me just say this. Don't you try to pass me up in the street and act like you don't know me because oh, I'm going to come for you. I would never. <laughs> I would never. Don't try it. And you know what else is yeah. interesting? So Jupiter is in my 10th house, which is the cusp is Aquarius. The ruler of Aquarius is Uranus. Uranus is in my seventh house. My seventh house is ruled by Sagittarius, and Sagittarius is ruled by Jupiter. So there's this sort you have of a mutual, mutual reception. Yeah, a mutual reception mm-hmm, thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just put that together now while we yeah. were talking, which is so interesting. Daria uses whole sign houses, and within that system, Aquarius is still my midheaven, but I've got a different sign on the cusp of the 10th house. The 10th house for you is Pisces. When I see Pisces, I always think art, and I think of art in a way that reaches many different people on many different levels. And again, like thinking about like the Pisces being the empathetic one that can reach across, like there's no walls with the Pisces. If I were to look at your chart and do a reading for you, I would say, or I I could see like art as healing as a way of like sharing your story, your personal journey in your childhood. The moon definitely signifies to me that your work is deeply personal to you, that the, the legacy that you're leaving behind is rooted in your personal story and how, and also a way of like how you manage your feelings right like you probably make art and like what you share out is a way for you to to process and reflect so there's the 10th house with the moon the moon being there but then there's also your sixth house so the sixth house is your daily work habits and like how you how you spend your time throughout the day. What are you giving your energy to? And your sixth house is ruled by Scorpio <laughs> and your Saturn is there also. Like your work is deeply personal and it, it's like you need a space to to be on your own. Like Scorpios need that space and time to just like brood and like be in all the feels. But again, it's also a very powerful energy where you're going to give your all and you're going to like exhaust energy going after whatever you set your mind to. And because of this Saturn, it also gives you a very disciplined manner, right? So it's not only (laughs) are you like giving your all to this energy, but you're, you got the structures in place so that you can. And it's like, do not disturb is on the door. I'm in my zone. (laughs) and this is going to happen there's no way it's not but then also you know about the Scorpio it's fixed because you are so committed and you're putting all your power behind it Scorpios are very intuitive and emotionally intuitive so there's also like a deep kind of trust you have to have with the work that you're doing which is why if it's of somebody else's design or of somebody else's vision that you have not bought into it'll be very difficult for you to do because you don't trust And you're like, I could probably figure out a better way to do this. (laughs) <laughs> and I, you know, like it's my way or the highway, essentially, when it comes to work for you. And that doesn't mean you you're not a group worker, a team worker. It just means you have to have a lot of investment in what the team is moving towards to do it. These are all facts, okay? And you may be thinking, which house system is right, child? <laughs> they are all right. Different astrologers have different preferences and techniques. Astrology is a science and it's an art. I find truth in both what Daria offered and what Deborah offered too. So to recap, our midheaven is at the highest point in our chart. And depending on what house system you use, it's the cusp of the 10th house. Both the midheaven and your 10th house can give you a sense of vocation, of legacy, of how the public sees you and views you. And the public can be your local community or can be on a world stage. Your public image and presence may or may not be based on your job. And that is also the point of this episode, to think about purpose as something that can include but is not limited to who you are as a laborer in the economy. Your second 
house of resources lets you know the materials you're working with, your gifts, what turns you on and excites you, what lights your fire. Your fifth house gives you an opportunity to play with that energy and your sixth house tells you how you get the job done, the behind the scenes, the nitty gritty details. Okay, so that was a lot and I hope it was useful. Be sure to hit up Daria and Deborah about readings, workshops, and their other offerings to support you with learning about your astrology and your cosmic blueprint. Their info is in the show notes. Also, hit up patreon.com slash Tajalin Lee at the creative foundation level or above to access the digital workbook I created to support you with integrating the information from this episode. You'll also be able to listen to the additional hours of content from interviewing our brilliant guests that did not make it into the final episode, but is helpful and informative nonetheless. I give thanks for your time, attention, and listenership. If you are enjoying your experience, tell a friend and leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts or on our website. If you'd like to share your story or perspective with us, write us a message or leave us a voicemail at blackwomenslabor.com. Find us on Instagram at blackwomenslabor and sign up for our newsletter to receive project updates in your inbox. You can also support this podcast by dropping some coins in our PayPal or purchasing the podcast music at colorgirlshustle.bandcamp.com. This podcast is created and hosted by yours truly, Taja Lindley, also known as the HBIC. Audio engineering by Lila Larson. Music by Emma Alabaster, who also served as the pre-production associate producer. Additional music production by Chip Belton. Vocals by Patience Sings. Mixing and mastering by Chip Belton. Lyrics by Taja Lindley and Emma Alabaster. Logo and graphic design templates by Homegirl HQ. This podcast is produced by Color Girls Hustle and supported by the Economic Hardship Reporting Project. Yeah, I mean,